Welcome to episode 14, the final episode in the Cursipanas series, season 2. I'm Bridget Welsh, and in this final episode, I want to talk about what the state election means for the bigger picture. I'm going to move away from the localities, where I've covered 12 different episodes, two episodes for each state, to talk about what this means for the country moving forward. So far in the episodes I've talked about, candidates, different places, different histories, different geography. I've talked about party infighting, leadership, different aspects of machinery and patronage. Talked about the challenges in particular that certain candidates face from different ethnic communities and the changing narratives that are shifting national politics with new forms of campaigning. And all of these issues come out, be it the emergence of TikTok or the importance of the kind of narrative that the national is using, the role of leadership in the debates and issues of the pull of Anwar. And what we've seen from this series, or I hope that you've seen, is that there's a lot of variation. And it's not just by state, but it's also across seats and sometimes even within seats. Malaysia is a country of tremendous diversity, and in this expanding democracy, that diversity really has a chance to bloom. Of the 12 seats that I focused on, some of them have gotten hotter, and some of them have gotten cooler. That's normal in part of a campaign process. But there's a possibility of losing the bigger picture, and this is why I want to close by talking about the bigger picture. So I want to finish the discussion by asking sort of big questions, giving some preliminary answers, recognizing with the important caveat that elections are still a day or so away, and as a result, there's still potentially some sort of swing that can happen in the final day of the election. But the first question I ask is, what are the stakes in this election? Coupled with that is the issue of why should people vote if you're in the six states that are up for election. Well, the macro issues are political instability. It's interesting, all the campaigns have used stability as part of their narrative. But in fact, it's only one that has really been pushing instability as part of its campaign thrust. We also see a situation of the economy. This has come in from two different parameters. One, people are concerned about the economy, and therefore there is the potential that they will be punishing the incumbent government at the federal level. But there's also the issue about what the election will mean for the economy, particularly in terms of investment, after the results come in. A third issue has to do with inclusion, about the different communities, about women, about different voices, not just for those that are wealthy, but also from ordinary people. Keep in mind that elections are about hearing the voices of the people. And finally, as yesterday's debate highlights, we also see the question about competency of those who are being elected and whether or not they're able to manage and do their jobs. Football players, influencers, as well as candidates that have been there for a long time that may be chosen by the party, but in fact may not be performing well. All these questions about competency and connectivity to voters, I think, are important in these particular polls. Not to be left out of this discussion is what the results will tell us. We'll be looking in particular at the issues of ethnic polarization and the divisions in Malaysia society and how discontent is being capitalized on as a political force. What we see is a situation where the mandate or the voters' messages will be important to interpret. And of course, as always in politics, there'll be many different interpretations. But let me tell you from the perspective of analyzing seats how important your vote will be. In at least 10% of the seats that are being contested, 26 by my count, looking and doing the analysis, these are seats that are just too close to even call. That means just one or two votes can impact the outcome. So every vote will make a difference, especially in the places where it is highly competitive. And there are different regions, even within certain states, that we can see that. In southern Kedah, for example or even in the seats right around Alastar, in mainland Penang, but also in southern Penang Island. In Selangor, there's so much competition in both the north, where we expected votes to shift, but also in places in the south, like Denkel, for example. And we see contestation on the eastern part, which we focused on Ulu Klang in my last episode. 
the ethnic composition and the nature of the candidates really are shaping seats that are very competitive in Selangor. Like we said, Bilan, originally I was thinking this there would be a divide between more established Adat areas and more border zones. But what we see because of infighting and also the type of candidates that are being chosen, we see quite a lot of competition throughout part of the state. So there still remains a few seats that I think are going to be determined just by a handful of votes. Also, why your vote matters is because people will be interpreting you. Indian communities, Chinese communities, Malay communities. There's this simplistic way of how they characterize voting. Similarly, so the youth, which got blamed in GE15 for the election results, will also be characterized. If there is a significant wave, and again, it will be blamed on younger voters, who I think hear the conversation and the narratives in this series have very different perspectives in very different localities. The contest in the state elections will impact the national stage and determine the momentum for the government and its viability. I make no bones about this. It will impact certain parties more than others. So this is not an ordinary state election. It is a mega state election with mega implication. The second big question I ask is, what did I learn about the politics in each of the states? Now, there's too much to cover in this episode to be able to describe the things that I learned about Trigano, about Keda, about Negri Simbila, and there's still so much more to learn. But if I was going to give you just a couple words to describe this election in the campaign, these would be as follows. In Trigano, the common phrase in refrain was, no issue. There was not much that people complained about, and I think we're going to see this in the impact of the results why the past government does very well in Trinado. In Klantan, the phrase was no choice, the sense that there wants to be change, but the alternatives on offer weren't strong enough and cohesive enough for many of the voters, including many of the young voters. In Negri Sambilan, the phrase was not here. There still is resistance to the change in political forces from outside, be it particularly PAS, but also comparatively weaknesses in terms of the institution of Bursatu. We'll see whether or not those undercurrents take a bigger wave than I predict. But for now, I think the phrase not here seems to capture Negrisimila. In Keda, I would use the phrase lost fight. The attacks on Sunusi actually made him stronger. And what we see in Keda is a strengthening of PAS on the ground as the polarization and the mobilization of ethnicized politics takes considerable traction. I'm looking in particular at that southern zone, seats like Sidam, Guru, Tanjun Dawai, even seats like Makar, Aram, and of course I highlighted earlier the seat of Bukit Slimbang. But the fight of Sanusi really capitalized on that state nationalism I mentioned earlier. And, of course, that sense of injustice that many Kedahans feel. For Penang, the phrase I use is no chance. The state government remains strong and will be re-elected. But like in Selangor, I predict that there will be significant gains by the opposition. I still remain uncertain whether or not that will extend to the mainland. My last set of scenarios suggests not so much. But let's see. And let's see how much the wave impacts Penang. In Penang, the politics is particularly ethnically polarized. And in Selangor, the phrase I would use is not enough. The state government, I feel, has performed to the degree in the campaign that it should win a majority in this coming polls. This is not to say that Perkin and National will not make gains. They will. And we will see how much those will be and what that will mean for a divided government. Now, what do I see as some things is happening? My article in Malaysia Keating will cover all the details in terms of the state areas. But in Kelantan and Kedah, I see PAS winning the two-thirds, at least at this point. Kedah is a little bit more open, but I think it favors the two-thirds for the Sunusi government for PAS. At all three of the Pakatan Harapan-led governments, I expect that those governments will be retained. However, I'm interested in looking at the configuration of the Negri Sembilan and whether or not that will lead to a shift in leadership cooperation. Over the process of the campaign, 
Roughly around 36% of the voters were undecided. And many voters, at least half of the voters in the state, which is true of Malaysia generally, only tuned into politics during the campaign. Those are the ones that will actually make a difference in the outcome. Among researchers, we're asking the question, what will be the turnout? What will be that number? You can still feel that there is that spirit, but it doesn't quite have that same hopefulness of the previous campaigns. From the perspective of Pakatan Haraba, it's Perkta National that will be capitalizing on that sense of potential promise, at least from their perspective. My sense is, however, is that the lack of resources that were used in this campaign compared to GE50, and this is true across the political spectrum, will actually shape the outcome and impact turnout because there aren't the same level of support for people who cannot afford to go back to vote. So what we're seeing is a situation of not really the status quo and asking this question of what will happen. Yes, the same governments will be retained, but we will see shifts in the configuration of power, shifts in the nature of the opposition. And of course, we will see statements made by the potential gains made by Purdue National that will affect the nature and the tenor of national politics. How will different political parties be affected? Before the campaign, I wrote an article that was entitled, Will Omno Be Wiped Out? My answer to this after the campaign so far, still with a couple days to go, is no, they won't be. In fact, we'll see them winning some seats, particularly in Negri Sembilan. But in some places, they will face significant erosion, and maybe even erosion altogether. Omno will have a very interesting reckoning that they will have to come to terms with if they have, as it looks likely, the continuation of a decline in support and decline in seats. Will Bersatu actually be able to replace Amno? I think they will make gains, but they're making gains still, or pass as strong, as opposed to their efforts on their own. We'll see how much of that and how much of the Bersatu-led machinery will impact the outcome. Will the young party Muda win any seats? It doesn't look likely that they will win any seats from what we can see so far, but no one expected they would at the very first outing, especially when you're going against two coalition machines. But they have interestingly have impacted the nature of the campaign and the issues of the campaign. And in fact, they've introduced new campaign tactics with the advertisements and different types of charama than the traditional ones. And we could go on with the different parties, but I think it's best that we wait to see the results. Then we can look at these things more analytically. But what's happened in this campaign is that Malaysia has had more normalization of turnover. People have looked to different options and considered being more risk takers in their voting patterns. We've seen this moment of accountability where there's been pressure. And it's interesting what we've seen is the Anwar government has introduced a whole series of new programs and new policies during this campaign period. So never forget that elections actually put pressures on governments to increase their deliverables. Malaysia is a place that is becoming more impatient with expecting results more quickly. The narratives in this campaign have had very significant ethnicized dimensions but they haven't had quite the same open hatred that we saw in G15, at least so far. And voters have begun to discuss many different things. What's so fascinating and interesting about Malaysian politics is the variation of issues that people are talking about. And while issues, for example, like the environment may not affect the overall outcome of the election, it has emerged as part of the political discourse in what we see as a widening and more vibrant democratic space. Before closing this series and closing this episode, I want to first take a few moments to thank the production team. Norman Chella at Renegade Radio is a whiz. Without him, I wouldn't sound good at all. <laughs> I'd like to thank the Keeney team, the producer, Thompson Howe, and of course, the visual editors, Feng Yi Win and Ku Shi Wan. Their videos, just studying what they're able to do with pictures and put things together to make the podcast more visual. I'd like to also thank Asniel at Malaysia Kinney for his lovely photos and my research team, which is just a couple people. 
as well as Hafiz to help me rent all the cars when I was traveling in many of those different places. A team is so essential, and we can't do things without other people. I'm really greatly appreciative. But my biggest thanks goes to the many Malaysians who spoke with me, be it the farmers in Urubusut, to the shopkeepers in Guru. Doing field work from the ground is one of the most rewarding things as a researcher. There were many, many times where I felt emotional at the kindness and the hospitality that I was shown. This is the lovely nature and the beauty of Malaysia, its people. I'd like to thank the stranger who bought my laksa and kena. May you have the merit that you see. And to the airlines who managed to keep on time, almost always, not quite, but almost always, this particular trip. As with all projects like this, they're driven by a desire to learn, a love of what you're doing, and a desire to share the learning. Thank you as listeners for being part of this. And for those of you who have the opportunity to vote, please use it. It's important. Your voices count. So friends, that's a wrap for season two of Kursi Panas. I'm sure things are going to stay hot, but I hope that all of you Stay cool.